Yes, uh, welcome back. And uh, now Radovan will take over uh, the discussion about uh, compute and quote and compute. And uh, Radovan, I think you haven't introduced yourself yet, even though you were at the back end with HackMD most of the time. But, yeah, really nice to see you all. Nice that you are here. My name is Radovan Bast, working in the high performance computing group in Tromso. And really here working on mainly on software, resource software, but also teaching training within Enris and within a project called Code Refinery. And I'm really looking forward to the next three sessions that I'm all part of. And first we will talk about compute quota and storage quota together with Dania. Then we then I will discuss how to be a responsible citizen on the, on the compute and storage resources that we have, what to do so that it's better for everybody else, but also better for you to have a better experience. And then together with Jan, we will also discuss if you have questions or if you need you know, help about resources, how to, how to ask for help, where to ask for help, also how to answer questions. So this, this also goes to, to my colleagues and to me so that we resolve your problems soon and help you out. And as Dania said before the break, there will not be any more breakout room exercises. So all the expert helpers, they can relax a little bit, but hopefully they still stay here and help us answering questions on the document ask questions and, and participate. You will have to do very little typing in the rest. There will be a few commands that you can still try. So if you have your Saga terminal open, keep it open. But a really good part, a good way to participate in the rest of this of today will be to watch what we do, follow our discussion, and ask us lots of questions on the document. So please overwhelm us with uh, questions. The more questions I have, the better. Also, the more questions from Dania and later from Jan. What did I forget? That's good. I will now go into uh, the first part here, compute and storage quota. And you will see that there is not much in here. There are some goals. There is not much text because we will actually go into our documentation and we will see what is in our documentation about it. And we will use our documentation as a basis for discussion. But I want to zoom in and set the goals for this session. So in the next half an hour, I would like to ask to learn about what kind of quota limitations are there for storage and for compute, why they are there and how to work with them because they can be a little bit confusing until we get used to them. But we will see that all of this makes really a lot of sense. And I would like to start maybe not with compute, but with storage quota for a certain reason, because I have prepared a little problem for myself. And the problem, before I resolve the problem, uh, it will be difficult for me to do the, the second part. So maybe we can start actually with storage quota. It doesn't matter. So we do we talk about storage quota first and then we talk about compute quota. Yeah. So but Sounds good? yeah, mm -hmm. great. But uh, what is like this exactly quota and why it's needed before we go to storage quota and what is yeah. the difference between storage quota and compute quota if if I ask you? Did I so ask storage... more questions? Mm -hmm. No, that's a good, good question. So well, what is it? It's a limitation. I will be, uh, we have a limitation in place on how much storage, on how much data I can put on the disks. And we will see how that looks and why. Okay, why do we need it? Because, because the resource is limited. If we didn't have quota in place, sooner or later, somebody would fill the disk. And actually it happened to me. So in many years ago on a different cluster in a different time, I have filled the disk because I made a mistake in my script. And then Friday evening, the disk is full. And this is because there was no quota limitations in place. So the, the limitations are not there to annoy people. They are there because we have this limited shared resource. It's big. 
petabytes and petabytes of data of storage, but still it's to not prevent like an accidental script that does something strange to not throw out all the other 200 users. So that's why they are there. So the storage and then the compute quota, I mean, same, same idea. Our compute resources are limited. We have a certain number of, I mean, so many thousands of cores. The day has only 24 hours. So we need to, when we then distribute projects, then you get a project allocation, you get a certain number of hours on a, on a, on a CPU or GPU. And then whatever we do on this machine, it gets deducted from the quota. Mm -hmm. And uh, is it a general, uh, the quota? I mean, if it, we have a quota system on our clusters, it can be different for other uh, sites cluster as well. Uh, or is it customized for our cluster? Or, um, how do you define that? Like, I think the, the idea that there is a compute, so compute quota is, is a concept that I think exists on every, every cluster and every also cloud resource that you go to, you will always be limited in what you can do. And it makes sense to limit because it, it is limited. So that concept exists everywhere. I would also I assume that any cluster that is larger than maybe you know a group compute resource that is in the basement of, of a building will have also storage quota in place. How these, how these then really behave they can be a bit customized. So what we will see is that in some of our systems, so even among our three clusters, it's they behave differently. So there are customization, but the, the concept and the idea and the motivation is general. Uh, the command we are going to use uh, on this uh, discussion can be different. Uh, it's also customized for our own uh, clusters, right? Or, yeah. yeah. Should we have a look how that looks? Yes, yes. So I first go into storage and I will not go here through the page line by line, but I wanted you to know where to find it. So you can find it from the course material, but you can also find it. So this is really our public documentation, the documentation .sigma 2no And there under files and storage, storage quota uh, is basically the discussion that we will have here, but I want to maybe let's experience it because Sooner or later, you will experience it as well. So I will resize my terminal here and I will log in into Saga. Two.ml and I should use my username. And if your username on your computer and on Saga is the same, you can actually go without. But let's do this now with. If you have, you don't need to type along with me, but if you have your Saga terminal open, you can try a few things in a moment. But right now, watch and ask questions. Let me log in. And okay, I'm on Saga here. I have I created a little example for myself, which you don't have on your accounts, so you can't do the same thing as me now. You might notice that the prompt here looks a little bit different than your prompt. Um, I have changed it. I have configured it. I wanted to have a little bit of colors. I also wanted to have the path not on the same line as the command because for teaching, I think it's easier for you to read where, what I'm typing if it's not on the same line. And I should also use I should also show you the command history, but actually right now, I have broken a little bit my system here, so I can't, I will do that in a moment, but not right now, right now. So here, I wanted to show you that it is possible to configure your prompt, but I will not show you how, this is for a different course, but it is possible. But you will notice that I have here two files. One is, one is some run script, and there is a large file with lots of zeros. And you can already guess what will happen. I will now try to copy this one into a different file. Boom. And this is something you will see one day. And if, so what to do now? If you remember yesterday, when Jorn was transferring files, he and encountered the same problem. And uh, uh, so he deleted some of his files. So 
you have to either delete unwanted file or move it to some other places because this is your home. You have this quota um, on your home. So how much is the quota for each home uh, directory, Radon? Yeah, good question. So let's, let's first, I will, I will answer it in a, in a few seconds. Let me first see what I got here. So the copy failed. I actually got a new file, which is empty, weird. And I got this warning. And then, so on. So what to do now? The thing to do now is we have a tool called dusage. It is not a standard Linux command, so you will not find it on a diff, on a, on your Linux machine or a different cluster. This is something that we have developed. It exists on our clusters, but it gives a nice overview of what's going on with disk usage. So that's whenever I get into such a situation, that's what I run. Let's see what we see. And here we can see that there is a problem here. The color is different, it's red, alarm bells. And answering Daniel's question, what is the quota? I'm here now on my home folder. And the quota is here for me, 20 gigabyte. I'm not sure this is the same for everybody. If yes. you have really good reasons why it should be bigger than 20, or what, what is the default? Is it 20? Or it's 10? 20 is the default. Uh, okay. 20 and uh, number of files, 10K is the default. Good. So it's good that I'm not more equal than everybody else. So it's 20. If you have really, really, really good motivation why it should be more, you can ask us for it. But as we will see, there are maybe the home is not the only place on this cluster. I'm now on Zaga. There are different locations. There are these project folders. There is a work folder. This one is interesting because it doesn't have any limitations. So that's cool. I can probably put a lot in here. There is a catch. There is a catch, and what is the catch? Uh, it's not backup. That's catch number one. So there is no backup. What is and, the catch number two? And it gets auto cleaned after twenty one days mostly. So yes. if if it's somewhere that some you are storing something there, after twenty one days it can be uh, cleaned up, and you cannot find any file or any of your files there. And if even if you write to us uh, to get it back, we cannot do that. It's permanently got deleted. Yes. And if you if I scroll up a little bit, what I got when I logged into the saga, it even informs us somewhere here. So here there's some information. So the user work is at least 21 days, up to 42 days. Depends a bit how full this is. But after that time, the files are gone. So it's good for, this is a good place for, you know, temporary storage. But I can see here what, what is going on. I have, I'm using more than I have available. And that's why I cannot create new files in this folder. There is a limitation on space. There is also a limitation on the number of files. I will, I will come back to this in a moment. This is, this is, I think, easier to understand than the number of files. So let's first talk about the space. So just, just a comment. Uh, maybe most of you know, may not see all these projects, only the training project, or if they are in any of other projects, you will see that as well. When you type, you do usage. Good point. And maybe uh, that's a more good moment too. So if you still have a terminal open in Saga, type the usage and have a look what you see. You will see different projects. You will probably not have a red color here. So have a look what you see there. This works on all our clusters. And now how, how do I recover from here? What what should I mean one, one way is I can delete it, but what if I don't want to delete it? I mean, this is a precious, precious, precious uh, research output. Okay. What can I do now? You can move it to some uh, project area. Is it precious? Then I won't recommend to move it to work, but for some Day, you need it only for a few days, you can move it to work and uh, yes. continue. I want to move it. I need it for the next 21 days. I will hopefully not forget to do something after that. But let's, so let me move it now to here. And that's something that confuses many. It has confused me because we will see that even moving it there will still not solve the problem on Saga and on From. 
let's see what it is. I will I will soon share with you my my command history, but right now I can't because even because the disk like my quota is so full that even that doesn't work. So let me move this large file into my user work. That should solve it, right? Yeah. Let's verify that the file is gone from here. It is not here anymore. Also, if if you have learned. I think yesterday we learned about du, which is a Linux command. du disk usage. So this is not the usage. This the usage is something we invented. du is something other people invented in the seventies. Uh, you can try this, and it will show you how much is used in the folder where I'm right now and everywhere below. Not much, one kilobyte. But let's ask the usage again. So why is this thing here? It still complains, and this confuses many. And it, we got a lot of support requests when we introduced this, and it doesn't show up here. Really weird. And um, and then that's typically the moment when people send us an email, like I did that. But why is it still? Why can why can I still not create files in my home folder? And the reason is that on Saga and on From. The quota is um, computed based on ownership, not based on the where it is. So what's the ownership? Let's do ls minus. Okay, of course, now I moved the file already. But let me have a look in in that new folder where I moved it to. The ownership is this. I'm not sure how much we talked about it yesterday. No, we, but, mm -hmm. we haven't talked about the ownership much yesterday, about especially the group things. Yes, we haven't talked about it, but also not a problem. And you don't have to remember anything I do here because, because it's all here. So troubleshooting, on this page, you will find troubleshooting when the storage is full, when the too many files. And then there is also a recipe on how you can change ownership on from and Saga. This doesn't apply to Betsy. So we can go in here, I'll jump to the bottom of the page, and we can try that recovery, which you also find here on the website. So I have exactly the same situation. So it's username, username G. It doesn't matter so much what these things really mean at the moment, but the compute quota is still charged to sort of my account on home. And the recovery is documented here, change group. Change group. And instead of this, it should be this on this file. Boom. And that's it. The usage. Now it's much better. It's much better here, it's much better here. 21 days later, this file will disappear anyway. Um, if you don't, if I don't do this, or I don't remember how, we have repair scripts in place that every night go through all the files and fix it because we know that this is non-intuitive, it's confusing, it's not what people expect. So we have, we, this, Ownership will also be adjusted to you if you don't do anything and wait until the next morning. This can be additionally confusing if you send an email in the afternoon saying that, well, I have this problem. And then in the morning, we all look at it and we don't see the problem anymore because the, the ownership has been adjusted overnight. So there are a couple of things that are helpful, but also maybe a little bit confusing. I'm looking at the questions. Anything we should talk more about this, this, the space? I also want to comment a little bit on this part here. But do we understand the space part and how to recover from it? I think uh, there is no question regarding uh, this, but some question regarding the how to apply uh, for resources. Maybe we could uh, discuss a little bit what we know about that uh, later. Uh, yep. during the Q&A session. Okay, good. 
It's also actually on this page. Is it? It should be. It or will it needs to be. But let's talk about it. Um, I want to go back to my example folder. And I have this file which is which is size zero. And now maybe a little bit philosophical question: Can I create infinite many files that are zero zero size on the machine? And the answer is no, I cannot, because we also have another limitation, which which we call files. It's the number of files. It's not completely correct. It's actually inodes. Inode, inode. What is an inode? Um, too many files, I nodes. Here is an example. Do I have an example though? This... So in my on on my home, I have a limitation that I cannot have more than hundred thousand I nodes. I'm using twelve thousand of those. What are inodes? The way I like to think about inodes, and we call it files because we know that not many people know what an inode is. The way I like to imagine an inode is library index, whoops, library index, library catalog, here we go. So today, I think when you go to a library, I like to think of file systems as a library. You know, lots of files, lots of books. They are somewhere in the building. Today, when you, when you look for a book in a library, you use the, the browser. When I was a teenager in the last century and I wanted to book, I wanted to borrow a book about Unix, I went to a library and it looked a little bit like this. So there were these catalogs. So you find the, where is the Unix book? You open the catalog, there is a little card. And on the little card, something like this. And on the little card, it says, the Unix book is in the second floor, you know, corridor F, third shelf, number so-and-so. And then either I go there or the, the friendly librarian goes and fetches the book for me. And this iNote index, it's a little bit like the library catalog. It will know where on the storage is the file, how, where to find it, where to locate it. And we can even try. Let's go back to the storage. Um, we can try one thing. Just adjusting here on my side. We can try, we have learned about LSL, but you can try LSLI, it's interesting. So for any fold, any file, any folder, you get these numbers. And this is the inode index number. So this is the norm, and this is the number on this library card. And they are limited. It's limited how many of these library cards I can have. And why is that? Historically, it's because it was a there was a limitation on how many of these shelves, how many of these drawers we could have. I'm not sure whether the limitation is still there. I think this is maybe not there anymore, but there is another reason. And that is we have, uh, it's a parallel file system. So you can imagine that there are several of these really helpful, very efficient librarians running around, fetching books, moving books, throwing away books, or writing books. So that's what we do when we do any file operations, but they all have to use the same inode index. In other words, metadata database. And these numbers are, so there is a database and this is the entry in the database and it will contain metadata on where to find this file or the other file. And why did I make this long excursion here? Because it's really quite important. So when, when we later talk about responsible use and if you sometimes wonder why is Saga so slow, I can't do anything, file system seems sluggish. It's very often the reason is that somebody is right now creating or moving or copying hundreds of thousands of files. 
And e even though we have these efficient librarians running around fetching your data, they have to synchronize through this metadata index. And it is a problem for them if we have extremely many files. So that's why it's limited. So that's why the limitation is there. But let's remember that it can also be a problem to have extremely many tiny files. It's a problem for the file system. It can be a problem for everybody else. So we can say like it's a, I know it's, it's a limitation of uh, number of files. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's a good way to look at it. Yeah. And what is the, I mean, what is the recovery there? What if I have too many files? Well, again, I mean, I can, I can go to a different. Okay, well, what is a typical situation? When when will I get? How can I easily get hundred thousand files? It's always Conda. It's yesterday. Uh, Jan yeah. experienced the same problem, so he was deleting all his Conda files. So mostly, Conda give you a lot of uh, small files. Yeah, and but it what... can also be really nice for everybody else that if you have so many files and you don't need them in the next few weeks or months maybe combine them together in one for one file yeah we have learned it yesterday how to archive small number of files in the one uh, file so you can come archive it uh, with tar or other uh, programs which are fami uh, familiar to you so one question regarding this uh, that we have this 20 gb uh, and 100k number of files quota for home directory but uh, it's uh, different for the project all uh, right project yes. you you have different quota and yeah. so here i have 10 million in some some project here and this is our course project so here we have a million yeah and it depends upon the uh, how depends upon the allocation how you get uh, got allocation of your projects uh, some projects get like 10 TB as a normal, some 100 TB uh, storage and number of files are different uh, for, can be different for different projects. Yes, and I will give us just a few seconds of breather and in the meantime, I will set up my history thing. So now don't type, this is just me here setting up, setting up so that we can see my commands. So I have a little script called save history. And now, okay, now everything I type will also show up down here, good. So let's go back to my example, excellent. Should we talk about compute quota now? Yeah, and I also would like to mention that the usage uh, also we can apply on our uh, need storage system. Uh, maybe when the output, uh, Maybe slightly different, but the usage command is uh, um, is there on the storage system as well. Mm -hmm. There is also a limitation, but uh, we are not talking about that yet. It's yeah. maybe for some so, other day. Excellent. So let's go into compute quota. Also, that is a page on our documentation. It's a different page. And it is how to find it. It's under running jobs. So high performance computing, running jobs, projects and accounting. And also here, I will not go through all the text. We want to, I think we understand why it's needed. It's needed because we only have so many cores and so many hours per day, but how to work with it and how to, how to plan your jobs so that you use this well. I will make this a little bit larger. You can also try these commands if you still have a Saga window open. I will just also open it up on my side window here so that I... Okay. So maybe let me... So we have this project. So when we apply for compute time, we get a project. We have one or more projects. Let's see what projects I have. And you can try what projects do you have. Projects. This is not a Unix command. This is also something we invented here. And it lists, in my case, four. Maybe in your case, one. And that's fine. Maybe it lists this one. The other thing that I often use 
to, if I don't remember anymore how what is the number for my project, I use cost. It will not only tell me which projects I have, it will also tell me how much is left in there. Yeah, so here they are. There are four of those. The most interesting one today is this one. You can see that this project got 10,000 CPU hours allocated and seven have been used. Not too much, so still 9,000 left. What does this mean, 10,000 CPU hours? It means that if I run a calculation on one CPU, it could run for 10,000 hours. Often we want to use more CPUs. So if I would use 100 CPUs, it would run for 100, it, I could run for 100 hours, right? And where do we use this information? I have an example script here. In my, in my run script. So this is some example run script. And if you have one from yesterday, you can look into that one. This is a job on Saga and this is where we specify it. So in my script, it has a certain name, it will run for one minute. I ask for certain resources. Now we are not really so much interested in this episode about number of cores and memory. We will talk about that in two weeks in our, in our follow-up course, how to select, what should I select here? Should I select four or 40? That's for another day. But here, here comes the account. So whatever I will do will be deducted from that account. And this is a little job that runs a few milliseconds because all it will do, it will, it will print a hello. I can submit it. Let's submit it as batch. And it will be finished in immediately. It's already finished. So what did I want to show you? I wanted to I wanted to show you that let me now modify the script a little bit and ask for more. I ran it now on four cores, which is silly because this will not use four cores. There will be three cores doing nothing and one core printing this. But let's imagine we have we have a computation that can actually use 100 cores. Let's imagine that for a moment. And I could submit this, and it will still finish after a few milliseconds. But what if I, what do you think will happen if I do, if I change the time, not to one minute, but I will change it to five days? Oh, yeah, then Slam calculate uh, the time. Uh, uh, the computer hours depends upon the time uh, you specified. Uh, here we go. Yes, so I'm, I'm asking 100 cores, five days. That is more than 100 hours. 100 times 100 is more than, so this will be more than 10,000. It's actually more than I even have on the account. So this will not even submit, I think. Let's try. Yeah, it doesn't let me submit. And what is the message here? The message here is that Slurm doesn't know how long my job will take. If I ask for five days and 100 cores, it doesn't know that it will actually use only one core and it will finish after a few milliseconds. And how, why is that important? Because First of all, if I ask for way too much, it doesn't let me because it cannot anticipate that I will not use the use all the time. It's also important to know that what will be, if I go back to cost, after my job finished, what will be subtracted from my account? Will, will it subtract five days or will it times so many, so many cores or will it subtract few milliseconds times so many cores. It will subtract what you used exactly, even yes. not what you asked for. Yep. 
So it will, it's it's not a problem for my account. Um, it's not the, it's not immediately a problem for my account because I will only sort of pay for what I have used, not for what I've asked for. But it it can still be a problem to ask for way too much because I may not be able to submit. Also, if I ask for a lot, what what it does then is that first it it deduces the the sort of the account and then whatever I have not used it gives it back but in the meantime none of my colleagues maybe is able to submit any jobs so long story short it's good to it's good to ask for approximately what you will need plus maybe 20 percent not 20 times more just to be on the safe side because another reason why this is not good for you is Again, Slum doesn't know that this will not take five days. And it's a bit like Sabri had this really nice example about restaurant reservations yesterday. And imagine you book a restaurant for lots of people for three hours. It will take some time until you get that booking. So maybe it's not tonight on Thursday. Maybe I have to wait until next week. And then if I show up there and I only say that, oh, well, I just want to drink an espresso and I'll be gone after five minutes, the restaurant people will not be so excited. The cluster doesn't mind because the queue is so long that the cluster just says, well, okay, they don't want it. There is a long queue of other people who want to run jobs. The next people can come in. But it will be a problem for you because you might have to wait a week until your job even starts. So don't ask for way too much. Long story short, what did we forget here about compute quota? Uh, nothing special, but it's also uh, if you see the, your job efficiency, if you ask request, uh, requested resources, it's also counted uh, when when we monitor job efficiency of your job. So it's also always nice to uh, not ask for more that I we will have this uh, uh, specific session next uh, next course uh, within two weeks time so that's uh, i also uh, heard that yesterday there were a lot of questions regarding how to choose the right amount of memory yes. that's also will cover uh, the next uh, course i just wanted to mention here yes and um, maybe i can just say that this is really difficult to answer how many course you have to test it out start small grow and have a look how does it affect your own time at some point you will see that adding more doesn't actually improve anything except costing more the other nice command that was also mentioned i wonder whether i still have the job number what was my job number here if you remember your job number you can try a wonderful command called ceph means like slum something efficiency here, well, it's not very useful because this was such a short job, but it can be really interesting to look at. I have used 0%. I have asked for 4 gigabyte. I used nothing out of it. So how much memory did I really use? How many cores did I really use? And not to ask for way too much because it will be a problem for you and for others. But more about that in two weeks. Yes. I think uh, we covered most of the things. Is there any question we should raise uh, from Hakamti? I... There's um, the Q uh, partition, or, or is it Q or partition, the pry and non-pry. Can every, does everybody access have access to all the Slurm queues? I think so. Um, if anyone else is there to come on that. Uh, it doesn't depend be... on the project uh, application. But, no. Not the queue system, but there is a priority list. That's what I my understanding. Radovan, do you have any comment on that? Yeah, I think what I can, so we have we have documentation on it, but what I can say now shortly is that if there are, so there are also priorities, we didn't talk about them. But we have we try to make it as fair as possible. 
there have been good reasons in the past. For instance, COVID research, super time critical, where we have given some projects a higher priority for a certain amount of time, if there is an extremely good reason for it. We also have queues. We have different queues partitions. So, so there are different queues, the development queue that is for testing. Because if you if you have a new job script and it fails after 100 milliseconds, it's really boring to wait for one day until it starts running, then it crashes again. Then you try something else, you wait another day, it crashes again. So if you are debugging your script or your program, we have a we have a different queue, but it's also supposed to be used only for testing and debugging. Some people have figured out that, well, my job starts sooner. I will just put my production jobs in there. And that's not that's not nice then. But we have more documentation on it. Maybe we can link to it um, from the document. Yeah. 